it will turn to Yes, please. So when were you in Chile? <laughs> so I was in Chile from... I, was, I spent there only five weeks, unfortunately. I was full back one day. But I... Am I speaking loud enough? I think so. Okay. So I went there five for five weeks back in... Sorry, in 2015. July, August. Mm -hmm. July, what, August. What took you there? Why were you working there? So, Why are you interested in <laughs> Okay, so I'll do a little rewind of the story, kind of. I basically grew up in Morocco, where I was, until the age of 18. And there was like this, my, my family is very, not political in terms of like political parties or politically active, but my dad has a very political mind. And so I was born, I was raised with this idea of just thinking of talking to politics very often around every single lunch table. And one of the things that came about a lot in media in Morocco is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that, it's not a question of it being one-sided, it's just that I saw the effect of that media on people and everyone surrounding me had a very like violent reaction to it where um, it was fueling more hate than empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, people weren't focusing so much on the empathy for Palestinians, they were focusing on the hate against Israelis. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was just misplaced. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of like Moroccan history as well with it because Moroccans in general kind of have this anger against Israel for taking their Jews because the Moroccan, the Jewish population in Morocco went from 250,000 to 2,000. Um, so the exodus was huge and people are still like, mad about that but it just it was just too violent for me so I just like literally ignored it I would watch it I would it would come into my mind and but I would never think about it properly and then when I went to the US to study uh, to, for college I met a bunch of people from the Palestinian diaspora and so I think that like slowly started coming back creeping up back on me and I only felt really ready once I started seeing Apartheid Week. Do you see what that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that a bunch of campuses do it, but at Columbia every year there's one week, it's called Apartheid Week, that's organized by SJP, which is the Students for Social Justice in Palestine. And um, you always have their side where they put up drawings, dances, dabka, everything for a week and people can go and ask questions and stuff like that. And then on the other side, originally it was the it was Hillel, which is a Jewish students association, but now there is an official club called Student Support in Israel, which is funded by the IDF, um, that puts a wall on the other side. So basically you have two walls on campus. Uh, and there are some interactions, but very few. But what was really interesting to me is seeing like the rest of the community that would just walk between those two walls and not even interact with them. And I was like, there is something of saturation. There's something of people not processing this or whatever, but something that's not connected. Like this is meant for people to go inform themselves and no one is doing that. And I think that's really what launched it for me. Yeah. Uh, and I think that I was like, it was two years into not being in Morocco, so I was kind of ready for that. I lived in the middle of nowhere, Western Massachusetts for two months, so I had time to just read. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to read. So I read a lot. And I started thinking about how I could contribute to something because that summer where I was really in the middle of nowhere is when the Gaza bombings happened, so 2014. And uh, that really shook me up. I was like, okay, like, there's no point for you to escape it. And one of my colleagues, we were like a very small team, and my colleague who was chairing the office with me was reading, would read the news out loud for an hour <laughs> to us in the morning. So I, I couldn't avoid it, it was there, I had to. And so I thought, how can I contribute to this? I don't know enough to contribute to it in a political or geopolitical way. And it's not of my interest because I feel that there's a lot already being done of people who are way more qualified and what was interesting to me is that people were saturated by that geopolitical conversation. And what I know and what I love is arts. So I was like, okay, let me try to see how I can make that happen. 
that same, so I was part of this college program at Columbia, which is this great program. Um, you get accepted into Columbia and you really get into it. And so they had this independent research grant for your last summer before your senior year. Nice. And I was like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I need. And you had done um, film studies? I, yeah, so I studied film at Columbia, but Columbia has a very theoretical film program, not like NYU, nothing production related. Mm -hmm. But I had been doing production on the side, doing documentary classes, so kind of dabbling into it. But I was really interested in how this independent research grant was for social sciences and in arts as well. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, that's what I'm interested in, because I want to go meet a lot of people. And then with that grant, you went to Chile? Chile. Uh -huh. And then you went to Palestine. That's it. Uh -huh. So I got the grant and I went to Chile for the summer of 2015. And I met around 15 people from the diaspora with the question of arts, especially music and dance, and the relationship to being a Palestinian descendant in Chile, mm -hmm. and how does, does that interact, and that's what brought the film. Yeah. And then cut to three years later, so this past summer, I managed to get into an artist residency, which allowed me to go to Palestine and do the whole thing. So that's very, very cool. recent. The Palestine part is very recent. It's three, four months ago, not even two months. So it's interesting because I went to Palestine the first time in 2012. So before. Yeah. And I also was there, and I actually sort of accidentally got there, <laughs> as I then tell in my book. And uh, so I was there in 2012. Gaza was being bombarded. It's always being bombarded because Gaza is this sort of lab. So for the Israeli uh, defense forces. So anyway, so it was being bombarded. I wanted to go to Gaza, I couldn't. And then I kind of really refocused my trip to actually my grandparents' uh, place of origin. And uh, so I was there, and then I actually wrote a first piece, um, a chronicle, a travel piece, a memoir, a travel piece that goes to Palestine and Chile from New York. Uh, talks about those encounters, what I learned in those places. So about. that's becoming Palestine. So that's becoming Palestine. And then I wrote a second part because my editor in Chile asked me, like, hey, you know, the, the book is just a little bit too short. Can you write an essay? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll write an essay. I'm usually very optimistic with uh, my calculation of time. Yeah. Actually, that took me another year and a half of study. And I wrote the second part and I finished it as. Uh, in 2014, Gaza was being bombarded again. So I was actually finishing this book while this very terrible thing was happening. And uh, it actually put a lot of intensity in that second part, which is also, it's a, sort of an essay. The first part is a chronicle and a memoir, uh, narrated by me, Lina Meruane. And then the second part is an essay, also narrated by me. By me but, but then it's the narration of somebody who studies the but the writing is happening while there's, you know, the bombing of Gaza. So that gave it a sort of an extra intensity to that book. And it actually came out really quickly because uh, it was important that the book was published right at that moment. Yeah. As we've talked, Chile has uh, the largest Palestinian community outside of the Arab world. And so there is a lot of attention to the conflict and people are very moved by what's happening in Palestine. Uh, not only the Palestinians, but because the Palestinians have mixed with the general population. Uh, if maybe there's today 500,000 uh, Palestinian descendants in Chile, and there's another 500,000 who are somehow related, you know, friends, family, uh, cousins. So it's a very sort of yeah, yeah, uh, which was what made my entering Palestine the first, the first time so difficult. Yeah. So so violent. I was traveling alone as a woman from a Palestinian family to Chile. So, and then I also had a German uh, visa because I had lived in Germany, and that didn't make sense to the police. Department. Yeah, and the more complicated you are, and the I was more trying, complicated yeah, Exactly, and I was like, trying to say like everything was true, but then everything seemed so suspicious. Like, everything can be suspicious. I know, I know, and for a paranoid uh, police system, yeah, it's 100%. like whatever you say, it makes it worse somehow. So anyway, 
then I learned that maybe you don't have to say everything. Just to keep quiet. The 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 game of of um, omission exactly is a because very the truth is, delicate is, is, one. is as problematic even if it's completely innocent as I mean you know so anyway so that so we actually were sort of working on our subjects and thinking about our subjects at the same time. I think actually 2014 really activated uh, sort of. Um, worldly conscience about I think so. what was going on. I don't know exactly why, but something happened at that time. And I do think that it has to do somehow with uh, social media. I think so too. I think because I could see how even people who weren't so politicized were still sharing that, you know? And I think social media makes, it has a lot of flaws, but one of the qualities of it is somehow get in to sensitize people mm -hmm. and like nudging them and unfortunately sometimes that brings and connecting you people also who don't know, who not know yeah. each other but are connected on like these issues 100 percent social media is also how like i manage to meet a bunch of different people because the people who uh, in chile yeah the people who gave me the equipment v via social networks via social networks uh -huh. So when I was in Chile, I went in and what happens when you're self-produced and you're 21 years old, 24 now, but when I was shooting, I was 21, is that cameras you order, they don't come, all that kind of thing. So I arrived and I only had my vacation camera, which was the worst quality ever. And so I reached out to this um, page on Facebook that was called uh, Artistas. Artistas Chilenos por la Libertad de Palestina. So Chilean artists for the freedom of Palestine. But I reached out to them to meet them. Mm -hmm. And I ended up meeting them. And there are these two Chilean, this Chilean couple. The man is a film director and the woman is an artist, um, a direct, uh, art director. Oh wait, are these the people who did the film on the Club Palestino? No, I don't think so. Because that really sort of describes that couple too. Really? No, I don't think so. But they did. They just made a documentary about the last uh, indigenous singer in uh, uh, Isla de Pascua. Okay. You, I'll, I'll, I'll send you yeah. more about them. But they're amazing. And so I just met them to talk about like what happened. And so she, they have nothing to do with Palestine. But they had friends who were Palestinian descendants at, in Chile. Uh -huh. But they belong to the group. They created the group. They oh, created okay. the page. Chilean artist for the freedom of Palestine, and it's a page that gathers Palestinian Chilean artists and also Chilean artists that are um, committed to the cause. And I just met them, and I started showing them whatever footage I had, and they basically gave me for free their camera for a week, their equipment. That's how the film happened, because they, so I'm like. Somehow networks get freed and unlocked by these social media. Like I literally just message them out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I am grateful <laughs> for that in any way. I was I was actually wondering one thing when you were mentioning how uh, 2012, 2014, these kind of things. You've said in to me and I think through your book. Now everything is mixing up. It's all the same. <laughs> <laughs> that. Although you are Palestinian descent, you weren't raised as Palestinian. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, if you still had a consciousness no, when of I, the when Palestinian say, conflict. When I say that I was not raised as a Palestinian, is that I'm not saying that I didn't know that I was from Palestinian descent, and we have, you know, the food and the, that kind of tradition, but we didn't really listen to the music. The stories were not told. I didn't learn Arabic because my father also didn't learn Arabic. We didn't go to the Arab school. We didn't belong to the Palestinian club. So I didn't socialize directly with that community. And I wasn't educated in a, in a way that would make me specially involved with that yeah. community or with the politics. Um, and so it's not that I didn't know, but also sometimes a little difficult to explain that um, a part of your you, we have many parts in our identity and those parts are not really significant if they're not a problem somehow. or if they're not sort of pushed in certain ways uh, emotional uh, in, in terms of good or bad right so I didn't 
have that sort of connection, that sort of really strong emotional connection with uh, the Palestinian world. When I get to New York, it is a month before the fall of the Twin Towers. And when that happened, I was I watched TV the entire day. I didn't have time to leave my home. And it was very obvious that there was a connection made between the falling of the Twin Towers and the Palestinians. Because what you saw on TV was you know, the, the Twin Towers falling, Yasser Arafat saying, I'm shocked, and then Palestinian children celebrating. And it was always the, the same five seconds. So basically the media was producing a thesis that this attack had, been, had come from Palestine. And so, and that really terrified me because I was born a Latin American uh, migrant that had come with a student visa to study. I had just arrived, but then also I was a Palestinian. So that really sort of frightened me. And I thought, how gratuitous is that they don't really know anything about the attack and already it's the Palestinians. And then it turned out it had nothing to do with the Palestinian affairs. So, so that made me immediately very conscious and actually a little worried. Um, and then I started really thinking about it. So this is the first time that sort of a red light is turned on on my Palestinian and Latin American And then sort of things sort of started adding up really slowly and still it took maybe another 10 years for me to really think um, very politically about the situation and really had to do with me traveling there. Uh, because one thing is to know and to read the newspaper and the other thing is to actually be there and think gosh, this, this could have been my dad's life and this could have been my life. Um, all the opportunities and privileges I've had just because my grandfather and my grandmother migrated as very young children and at the time there were lots of um, uh, social advantages for people who did not have money, especially migrants. And so my dad and I and my aunts went to university, and that's how I also went to university and had the life that I have now. So I felt like there was a lot of privilege on my side, and that there was a lot of unprivileged people that actually were my cousins and family. And so that really sort of, that's where I really, that made a connection. I felt uh, responsible uh, to do something and I did whatever I could which is right. Uh, it also gave me the opportunity to read more and understand the history because sometimes it's just you feel that only writing about your experience is just a very very focused narrow way to write about something. So it doesn't, I mean I, I felt that, I'm also a scholar right, so I also felt that by giving it more layers of knowledge and trying to read on both sides the histories, looking at not only the Palestinian version but the Israeli version, the Jewish version, and also the very critical Jewish scholars that have revised those histories gave me a really sort of in-depth understanding of uh, what is going on. So the book, that's what the book tries to build. Yeah. And I think that it has been not only helpful for me, but it has been super interesting to find people who tell me Jewish people in Chile, other migrants in Chile, or even like uh, friends and Palestinians say, thank you for writing the book because it explains to me a lot of things that I don't get through the media and now when I watch the media I understand actually what is really happening on the front. Yeah. So I thought that that was good and also it does sort of, it does sort of connect with people who have uh, migration in their background, sort of a way of looking and thinking about that, uh, that whole big question which is very relevant for us today because we're all migrants and now we travel more than ever. So I think that gives us sort of a lot of like spaces to, to think and it's really an invitation to sort of travel with me into the history and thinking of the problem. I, I, I mean, I, when I was reading the first part of Becoming Palestine, your own narrative mm -hmm. part, the, the, memoir. the memoir part of it, I I love this part where it, that's called Waking Up. Mm -hmm. And so it's a conversation that you are having with a man who grew up in the US, who's mm -hmm. Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Alan, or at least you name him Alan yes. in the book. Um, and 
this conversation about how he was raised in Chicago in a very Zionist family and then come into Israel and realize it and that what he had been told is not necessarily what's happening. And that when I read it, it just came as a direct reference or it, I was like, oh my God, we thought of the same thing at the same time. Because that's a part of the conversation I have with my characters in my film, with one, where one of my characters, Teresita Giacaman, who is the director of Amal, an NGO in Chile, uh -huh, yes. for the main, for maintaining, they're the ones who produced the documentary about Club Palestino, oh, okay. um, about maintaining the Palestinian culture in Chile. She says, I think that the solution to the colonization of Palestine and to this whole issue goes through two aspects. Mm -hmm. One is the empowerment of the diaspora, and the second is, and she uses the word despertar, the waking up of the Israeli society. And so I just, it, I, I loved how those two ideas met through your book and through the film. And it also made me think a lot of, uh, my interaction with this kind of thinking has a lot to do with uh, campus, university campuses mm -hmm. and uh, student activism because there's this group that's now in a lot of different universities yeah. in the US called Jewish, Jewish Voice for Peace, um, where Jewish students, mostly Americans, um, participate in the conversation with SJP, Students for Social Justice in Palestine, to think about how the narrative that's given of putting in the same box Judaism, Zionism, pro-Israeli government decisions, all that gets unpacked and separated because it's not fair yeah, to have it exactly. that way. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I, I actually also looked at that super closely in my book, especially in the second part, which is to look at also criticism coming from the Jewish people inside and outside. But coming back to that comment that uh, you, you were um, quoting before, uh, what I think is very difficult is to have people change their minds within the problem within Israel and Palestine because they've had so much to deal with. And they are very sort of indoctrinated in a way. So I think that without sort of um, taking off their shoulders their own responsibility for change and their own work, I do think that it is in fact true that it is the, the diaspora of the Palestinians outside and others, plus the Jewish people outside that can sort of think a little bit more freely. Um, and also visit and see what's going on. I think this is the, the community that really needs to get activated. Or at least I think that's the work that I am trying to do. So to activate the people who are outside because without international pressure, this is not going to happen. And there's just like one little, very super tiny sign, um, Merkel, uh, uh, Germany's uh, Prime Minister we went to Palestine very recently met with uh, Netanyahu and, and she said, you know, I think you should be thinking a little bit more on how you treat your minority. Uh, we don't like that so much and I think that it's the settlements are making it very difficult, uh, more and more difficult to achieve peace because how do you get the settlements out of there if you're going to divide the state in two? And um, they were not happy, they were not pleased at all with that comment. And I thought, well, it's about time. Because, 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 you know, because Germany is giving a lot of money to Israel, but is never asking in return for some sort of human rights uh, restrictions. And the same thing with the United States. And it's only going to happen if the, if the, if, you know, if the economy and the, and the, the politics actually the pressure. So, so I think that that's super important, and, and that's where the sort of the local communities in Germany or in the United States or in France, right, need to be more active. Yeah, that's the part that I'm also interested in. I, I think that I, but this is something that I would love to talk more about with you is the position of being an outsider, because. I mean, you have Palestinian descent, I do not at all. Yes, but you speak Arabic and you're Arabic. <laughs> so there is this thing, but there's this thing of us not being Palestinian or Israeli and not being 
physically there. And so there's part of in your book where you mention uh, you tell the, one of the characters in your book um, that it's so it's so brave to be living there. Yeah, we are not making that choice. We are outside of there. And I think that that's also how, how I approached it is through something of a diaspora because I think that's how I connect with it because I am part of the Moroccan diaspora as well. And um, But I always struggle with what is my position as someone who is not yeah. Palestinian. Yeah, because we do have this sense of uh, not having enough authority yeah. on a subject because we are not from there. But I think that that has been sort of uh, inflated a little bit too much, the question of who has authority to speak and who has it. And of course this comes from, from actually people taking over the voice of the other and representing them instead of allowing them to, be rep to represent themselves. And that is of course a very important question. But when you film somebody who speaks his own uh, you are becoming a vehicle. You are not speaking for them. So I think that, and, and that sort of allowing them to speak, showing their voice, having them sort of tell their story, um, I think is also super important because that story is not being heard. So I think that, I mean, I, I do know what you're saying because I feel the same way. Who am I to tell the story of the Palestinians? And of course, I have family who came from there that happened a century ago. So my, my position, and I think it's similar to what you did in your work, is uh, explaining that you are the filter for the story and you have a position, which is your historical, your personal, your political position. But then, once you've said that, you've shown your, your cards, so to speak. You're, you're saying, this is where I'm standing, and then you try to allow other people to speak through you too. And I think that's the only thing we can do. But if we are going to be sort of shut up because we're not authorized commentators, then we are doing a misfavor to the situation because then because the Palestinians are also not heard. They do not have a microphone. They do not have a standing. They are completely uh, uh, read as terrorists, not as victims. And so I think that 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 I mean they're not only victims, but what I'm saying is that they do not have a strong voice. When, and we see that in the votes of the UN, they usually get denied what they're asking for. And sometimes they're really minimal things. And so I think that it's important to also become some sort of vehicle and you know, not take the microphone away from them, but use the microphone when they're not there to also speak about the situation. Yeah, I, th I, th I thought about this because I always was really conflicted about how do you speak of a situation that you don't live in. Mm. Right? Um, and of course, it's, it's another version of the situation. It's not the truth. No, it was the same thing when I went into Chile because I was thinking, I'm neither Chilean, I'm neither <laughs> or nor Palestinian, yeah. but I'm here. I think that it made me think even more when I was in Palestine. Um, because I think, I don't know if this happened to you, but it would be interesting to me because your medium is writing, my medium is mm -hmm. film. And when I was there, I, I mean, to be fair, I was there only for eight days, and that's very short. Yeah. Well, it was 12 days for the but eight days at Bethlehem working mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. project that I started. It was really just like a start for a project. And something that struck me there is uh, the suspicion mm -hmm. that people had. And I think that it's not just because of Palestine, it's because of what I was looking for. I was looking for Chile. And Chile in Palestine lives in a very old time. Mm -hmm. And so people had this, it took me, I think out of the eight days, it was the sixth day that was the first time I could record someone. Mm -hmm. Not even just the image, but even the sound. People were having such a hard time with that. And I think being perceived, I don't know what people perceive me as. Some people perceive me as American as mixed black, white, American when I was in Palestine. People didn't read me as Arab because the Arab they know is the Levantine Arab, not the North African, Moroccan Arab. So it was really interesting how I navigated the public space. People were very suspicious of me with my camera. But I know that it's also a history, unfortunately, of the use of the camera as surveillance by the Israeli military. So I was told I was, told, I was walking through Bejala and I was taking pictures of buildings. And so this man, this, these children 
hid behind a car. I thought that they were just playful, right? And then they got, they went to get their one of their parents, I'm guessing, an adult man who came and he was like, "What are you taking in a photo in Arabic?" And so I responded to him and I told him I'm only taking the the buildings. And he was like, "Okay." I was like, "I promise, I'm not taking photos of the children or anything like that." And I wasn't. And a few days later, I met a person um, who lives there, and she was like, "Well, a few years ago." Um, there was this man who came, a younger man with a little backpack, took pictures of the house. A few weeks later, the house was destroyed by the Israeli army. So people are know that yeah. the Israeli army navigates the space in civil uniform or in out of uniform. So you you are coming into a space that's already marked by the camera that you're using for your project. Yes. And people are extremely suspicious of that and also of history because I'm asking a question of something that is told by your grandfather or you, yeah. do you remember when you were a child? And because there's an erasure of actual marks of history, people are so unsure of their memory that they don't want to give you something that's going to be marked forever in a camera roll or in a sound recording or something. And that was really interesting to me and I was wondering if when you write there is something different about the medium which allows people to talk to you because you're not necessarily recording them, you're more in a conversation. Yeah, but it's different because I think that when you record somebody speaking, then that image is usable. It's, it's sort of quotable. And fa facial recognition and racial profiling are just so, so intense in that area, right? It's, it's just a sort of a, a dangerous, even a dangerous thing, right? yeah. whatever you appear is saying. So when you write, uh, it's different because you can change names, you can change identity, and also I even sort of use the sense of censorship and, and, and fear by actually marking out uh, parts of the text I saw that in black. Just to sort of illustrate that people actually ask you to you know, off the record, kind of, put it off the record, silence that part because that could put you in danger, right? And I thought, I thought a lot about this, like, how do you do that in paper? Like, how do you cut it? But at the same time, show that, it show that it's being cut. It's like when you sort of blank out a face on film, and you have the people speak, but, you know, you, you have like this blur. So I tried to produce that same thing in the writing, just to sort of give a sense of, people really being scared of actually appearing uh, at, in, on record saying something that might be uh, problematic for them. And that was the case of my friend who has is married to a Palestinian Muslim. He has children with her and he's always worried that he'll come to the, to the airport and not be allowed in if he appears saying something, right? Because friends of him have been down. So, so yeah, I, I actually wanted to, to shift a little bit because I know we don't have much more time, but I wanted to know why that case? Because, you know, we sometimes choose our subjects accidentally, but sometimes we already think of what we want to do. And I thought it was so interesting because I'm, for example, I was, I was thinking through your documentary, I've seen it so many times now, and when I got married, uh, we had a party in Chile, and uh, as a surprise thing, my dad had brought in two belly dancers who were completely spectacular, and they really animated the, the party, and we all danced with them, and then they left, and it was a super spectacular and super fun, and it was great. But then I was thinking, oh wait, but this is not, you know, there was this criticism of belly dancing as erotic dancing that is representing uh, the Arab world, in a way that has become sort of a little bit cliche, uh, but that the real sort of political dance, or the real traditional dance, the folkloric dance, is actually, and, and also the the question with the lyrics uh, that have become that have become so politicized, right? And so I was wondering if you already knew this, if it was by chance, you know, how did that happen, and what were your choices there? I think that for forever, I've been extremely touched by dance in my own life but also in my films. So my other film, Alamidni Queer, 
that will come out at some point is also about performance and physical performance and one that I'm preparing more about is also about dance so I think I've always had this thing about the body and how it can speak so much more than just words um, I think it, it just goes into a different realm words are very useful and, but dance has this thing of I, I don't like the word universality, but it does touch because we're talking about body. So I knew that I wanted to focus more. I, I was going for music and dance. I had seen Dabka before on campus because I had Palestinian friends of mine who had created a Dabka group. So I had seen the dance, but I didn't understand the political part of it quite yet. Mm -hmm. I could listen to the lyrics and all that, but I didn't trigger anything particular in me, but when I arrived in Santiago, I realized like how popular belly dance or danza Arabe, Arab dance is in Santiago. Everywhere there are belly dance studios. It is crazy. I, I just had never... Are you talking about an area called Patronato or the city No, in even in, this, in the general city, there is... In Patronato there is a lot. Patronato happens to be the heart of the Palestinian community in Santiago. But even in different... Um, in the heart of textile. As well, yeah. yeah. Which happened to be the first commerce that Palestinians went through and that's how they most a lot of them thrived economically. But it was so interesting to me because I was like, okay, so clearly everyone knows belly dance. <laughs> no one is like, oh my god, I've never seen this before. But it has also become this very exotic form. So depending on the studios, people do it differently. Anna Marie, who I choose to follow in my film, she does it very differently. And that's why I loved her. I went for the first class and she was distributing the biography of Kulthum to all of her students, telling them, next class we're going to dance on this music, belly dance. And it's important for you to know who this woman was because she was an instrumental um, part of Arab music for such a long time. So her relationship to teach and dance was very different from what I had seen. But, but that's not really in your film. No, because uh, I couldn't. I wasn't there yet with the camera. I was just there talking with her, and I, I was so upset that I missed that moment. But yeah, she has that relationship to dance, um, and so belly dance was already very public. But then I went to Club Palestino, so the Palestinian club, and I saw the Dabka group dance there. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, there's something else here going on. Mm -hmm. And I started getting more interested in Dabka, and I was talking with different people who had gone, because a lot of the people I met who were raised very Palestinian had gone through the Arab, Arab uh, high school, all of that had at some point been part of the Dabka group of the group Palestina. Even uh -huh. uh, was yeah, telling because me because it's the regular thing. To yeah, do. so it's all one of them. The activities. I yeah. would meet like a forty-year-old, but he would tell me twenty-five years ago I was part of that group, and so I started like learning more about Dabka in my research prep. There was already the idea of focusing on Dabka, uh -huh. but not so much because of the political side of it, just because of the uniqueness of that dance rather than belly dance, which I thought was too international, yeah. already too appropriated, uh, and then really and too panoramic. Also, right? yeah. yeah, and not too specific. And then I met Anne Marie, and I was like, okay, there is something so interesting. And she was in the process of creating a Dabka workshop, mm -hmm. so I was like, okay. We can work more with this and the Dabka every time I see it like the other night when the Dabka group came to perform I feel it in every single bit of my body you know because the that's what happens she doesn't mention it in the film but in 1948 not only with the creation of Israel not only did the lyrics change to become more politically involved so before they talked of love um, uh, happiness, sadness, sorrow, all of these things. 1948, they've come about the the patria, the nation, the the nation. Balad, the Watan. They start talking about this whole thing of uh, belonging and the politics of a territory that's being taken. So really, like there is a shift. There's also a physical shift in the dancing itself because uh, Dabka in general, if you go to Lebanon or Syria or Jordan, because they're getting impacted as well by the Palestinian Dabka, but they're more in the air kind of dances. In 1948, you become more related to the ground. So you notice that there is like a real... It would be interesting if you were to re-edit your film to sort of include a little 
bit of like how those lyrics have changed. Oh, I know. Like, right? Because it really, like what you're saying, is so interesting and it doesn't come across very I think that's going to be another project at some point of yeah. that. Because yeah. I'm so interested precisely in the way, like she says, I really do have to go back to Chile and, you know, have these like little bits and pieces. Bits. Yes. Yes. She mentions uh, towards the land, like whenever you step, you're going towards the land. So there's something of actually becoming more enrooted in the soil rather than being in the air. You feel that when you watch the dance, right? The way they're stepping so strong on the, on the floor, right? That I was actually even worried. The when floor would break? Yes, yes. Because <laughs> they were like really, so that was really strong. Yeah. Was, I think six of them, right? So, but you do feel this sort of really strong connection to the earth, to the floor, right? And it's a sort of a very grounded dance. Yeah, which is very different to um, belly dancing, which is very light, very very airy, so to speak. This is actually very grounded. Yeah, hmm, that's very interesting what you're saying, but that doesn't come across so strong. I, I think that in that's, video. that's also the limits of filming within a week. Yes. I really was with her for a week, uh -huh. and so some things came out, some others didn't, mm -hmm. and I, I'm hoping that it's just an opening onto something else. But uh, I think also what I like about Babka, and now that I'm talking with you, that's when it's coming to my mind, is that precisely it's a very grounded kind of dance. Moroccan dancing is very grounded as well, and that relationship the ground is so we do like she mentions it in the film she says every woman in the middle east dances baladi yeah. where whatever we think of belly dance mm -hmm. it's true we do have a little bit of hip and a little bit of, of lifting the foot or doing things that way but the actual not folklore is a weird word but yeah, yeah the, the more traditional the more traditional moroccan dance has a lot to do with grounding yourself in the floor and i think that that's something that is completely subconscious in me that I'm more sensitive to that kind of dancing mm -hmm. than uh, yeah. the it's more It's interesting how the body one. brings in the meaning and sort of the yeah. sense of belonging, right? Like staying and not leaving anymore. Yeah. And there's acknowledging your land, right? So that's very interesting. I, yeah. I, yeah. I hope that it, it transpires at some point or someone but, but, decides but you, to but do you could a project also think on of, it. Of, uh, yeah, but you can think of <laughs> Your project as a starting point, you could always go back for another week. Oh, I think that that's what and it re is. Re interview and and you know and do a little bit of a follow up because I do think that these elements, these cultural and political elements, are super interesting and they're really set very quickly in the film. Or for example, the element of the cultural education that uh, Anne Marie does uh, in her uh, lesson. You know that part it could be sort of. Uh, you know, made more uh, evidence in the film. Because I do think that what she does is very particular, right? She's not only doing dance and teaching dance and about the body, she's also teaching people about a culture. Yeah, and the the history, history. And history. And that is actually, I think, very important. And I actually was very impressed by the way they speak about the culture and uh, the conflict and the ways in which they think about resistance and resilience. I thought that that was a very, very powerful also in, in, in your piece. So. I think we're just meant to both of us to just go back and forth between <laughs> Chile and Palestine forever. Because <laughs> every time, I, I, I think that that's how I felt as well with reading your work and talking with you, is every time you go to Palestine, there's something new that comes out. Every time you go back to Chile, there's something that go, yeah. comes the out. Is, you know? the, these works that are so uh, grounded in ethnography, it's like they're unending. It's like I feel that each time that I travel, I could add a little piece more because it just sort of it's just another layer of, you know, it's never an anecdote. It's really sort of, it contains so much more on the question of identity, on the question of travel, on the question of politics. Um, yeah, it's, you, you're trying to register like things that are happening uh, as they evolve, right? And that's sort of, sort of a, it feels like unending. Like you could continue to write or film forever. That might become just a special thing. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think we're done, right? I think yeah. so too.